God not only answers prayer, but that He knows how to answer prayer. And answered prayers can come in a whole lot of different ways, can't they? Um, for an example, today, don't like current things today. The Lord, I believe, answered the prayer. Yeah. 
know, now before church, I got this phone call from Lynn. And there, he, he, calls his, he called his mother. His mother was in the shower. This was, we were looking for church a little bit. And then he said, I called mom, she didn't answer. He said, then I, <clears throat> excuse me. He said, then I called McDonald. She told me she didn't want to talk to me. And then dad, you were third on my list. And I said, well, how is it that I got promoted here? <laughs> Third, you know, I used to be way down there. I never got phone calls. But anyhow, he said, Dad, he said, what are you going to preach um, tonight? And I said, well, I'm going to preach on understanding man. And he said, good luck with that one. Understanding and now a few years ago there was somebody and I didn't read the book I've heard about the book but someone wrote a book and in that book was the title of it was Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Some Other Planet but we don't come we don't come from the same so however tonight I'm really not going to focus on the women's side of this I'm just going to focus upon the man's side uh, and tonight um uh, well, let's, let's read the scripture. Would you turn, Jamie, get 1 Kings, the 11th chapter. 1 Kings, the 11th chapter. And I want to read right from the top, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I'm just going to focus my thoughts tonight on the impossibility, the impossibility of really knowing what's in a person. You know, at the end of the day, or at the end of whatever, how is it that we come to know, and if you do actually then come to know, what are you going to do with that knowledge? And as I begin to think about, um, think about this, you know, the Lord said one time, it's actually, I believe it's in, it's maybe the last verse, if I'm not mistaken on this, Debbie, am I right, in John, St. John 2, the last verse. And Jesus said some words like this, he says, I, I, I do not commit myself to man, for I know what's in man. And, you know, that's a big saying to say, you know, I'm coming into this knowing the treachery and knowing the risk. Jesus, you know, in dealing with this little segment of humanity here in this, in this that he was about. In fact, Jesus said toward the end of his time, actually it was at the last Passover meal that Jesus shared. He told his disciples, he said, look, I chose 12 of you. 12. And one of you is a devil. Okay? They're sitting around a big table. Passover. The lamb. The wine. The bread. The bitter herbs. I mean, the whole thing laid out. And they're sitting there, and Jesus is that very evening going to be crucified. Okay? And so as they sit around that table and the Lord says, one of you is the devil, then the muttering begins to start uh, between this one and this one and this one 
Lord, is it I? Lord, you know, hey, could it be me? I mean, really, and it gets down to a point right there where the, 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 the message is, is that many times men do not even know themselves. Okay? And further along this line, you know, Jesus had the Apostle Peter out and was visiting with him, and he said, Listen, Simon Barjona, I need to tell you that Satan hath desired to have you so that he can sift you out, shake you down. The Lord said, But Simon, I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail you. And so Simon Peter says back to the Lord, Lord, no sweat. He didn't say those words. I said those. I will not forsake you. I will not leave you. I am with you. I will stay until the end, whatever that end may be. But here again you have an example of a person who just simply did not understand even then, the potency and the power of, this, of the fear that was going to come upon him that would cause him to deny that he even knew Jesus. On three separate occasions when he was confronted with it, he denied it, denied it, denied it. That brings me back to this that I have here. King Solomon. Do you know that Jesus made a reference to King Solomon one day to some folks that he was talking to? And he spoke of the glory of Solomon. And he spoke of the queen from the south that came miles, many miles, hundreds of miles from Ethiopia to see this house that Solomon had built. And the words of his judge, judgments among the people and the wisdom with which he executed those judgments began to just spread throughout all the earth. And people came for several reasons, but they came to see Solomon, to see the house that he built, just to observe, you know, well, I've heard this, and I want to see this. And she came. And his words and his wisdom, Jesus said, you know what? Solomon had somebody travel from way down south to hear his wisdom. And the Lord said, look, a greater than Solomon is here. And you know the story of Solomon? Everybody knows the beginning of he's David's son. And actually, he's not David's oldest son. David has older children, but the mother of Solomon appealed to David to dethrone his eldest son and to put Solomon into the throne room. And David agreed to do that, so that's why you have Solomon. And you know the story about how he judged the two women. And it was the first illustration given in Scripture about his judgments. But it seemed like, you know, he was, oh my goodness, his heart was so in tune with what was right. These two women came to him and they were pleading. They had a situation developed. And each of them had a baby, but one of them, one of the babies died. And the woman whose baby died got up in the middle of the night and took her little dead baby and put it over here in the arms in the bed with the woman who had a live baby. And she took the little live baby and came back over here and laid it in her bed. And the next day, the dispute arose between the two women as to whose baby was alive and whose was dead. So they came to Solomon for judgment. And as those two women stood before him, talking about, 
you know, this and, and the, you know, going through the whole thing with him, he says, he says, bring me a sword. Here's what we will do. Take the living baby. Bring it here. Give me a sword. I'm going to cut it in two. And we're going to give half to you and half to you. And the mother of that baby says, no, give it to her. And so the wisdom of Solomon's mind and heart began to spread. And my goodness, he was held in such high esteem for a period of time. But when we get to the 11th chapter of 1 Kings, I mean, the story really takes a turn here. And you wonder, what is it that is in man? What, what, what is, listen, how is it that a man can start off in such a good, a good ministry, a good direction, and then <coughs> something turns? Do you understand what it is that causes people to turn from one thing to another? <clears throat> Listen, church, every one of us in here have dealt with things in life where we thought, hey, man, we really knew, we, we know this part, but then at the end of the day, you say, I really didn't. You know what? There was not a whole lot in my um, education at Joe T. Robinson High School that I retained. I don't even know how I graduated, honestly. They say I had ADD. Actually, I didn't have ADD. I mean, I could focus. But I wasn't focus, focusing on the right stuff. But one time, I was caused to read a story in 10th grade literature about Julius Caesar. And all I remember about that story are three words. Do y'all remember them? That Julius Caesar uttered? He said, you too, Brutus. Am I just way out in left field here with this? Anybody know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Julius Caesar. Shakespeare wrote the play. Julius Caesar had this loyal bodyguard, confidant. I mean, Brutus was, I mean, he was, he was, he was Julius Caesar's man. But when the treachery boiled up and boiled over, do you know who put a sword through Julius Caesar? And Caesar turns to Brutus and he said, you too, Brutus? Now I know that I'm not the only one in this little church house that read that story. The point, though, again, is so well taken. In Shakespeare's mind, here we have men who don't know, they don't understand the forces that are at play in life. Sometimes the forces can have us going in the right direction. We just, maybe sometimes we're just born into it. But then this life begins to take hold of us and begins to shake us and shuffle us around. And then the first thing you know, you're questioning. You're just questioning. Solomon was a person that was gifted. But you get to 1 Kings 11, and it says Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, <coughs> The Zidonians and the Hittites. My goodness, where does it end? Verse 2 says, Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them. You shall not, they shall not come in unto you. 
For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. <coughs> Solomon clave unto these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Understanding, understanding man. Jamie, would you put a scripture from Jeremiah, 17th chapter, the ninth, ninth verse up here? Listen, I think that it is important that we understand what we're dealing with when we're dealing with people. Do y'all? I think it's important that we understand that men, oh, well let's read this, Jeremiah 17, 9. <clears throat> what in the world would cause him to pin this? You know, Jeremiah was a prophet out of Israel. And he was prophesying at the moment in time just before Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, which was situated down south of Egypt. Jeremiah was prophesying to Israel. And he had all these messages to Israel, to the kings in Israel, to the priests in Israel. Jeremiah had this burden upon him that was placed there, and he had to speak the words that were placed in his heart, even though there were times where he did not want to. I mean, he he, he tried to get away from it, but the Lord said, no, you, this, this, he said, I did my best to refrain from speaking the word of the Lord. He said, but it just burned. And, but Jeremiah was abused. He was imprisoned. He was starved. He was, Jeremiah was, I, I think I've heard, heard it said that Jeremiah is referred to as a weeping prophet. And Lord have mercy, he had enough to weep over, but Weeping over Israel at that time is what Jeremiah was doing. And Jeremiah had dealt with Israel for years and years and years. He dealt with their meanness. He had dealt with their treachery. He had dealt with their abuse. I mean, Jeremiah was this, this man, a good man. And, and he... Um, you know, that song that I sung tonight about the broken vessel, Jeremiah, I think it's in the, the maybe the uh, 19th chapter. I'd have to go look it up here. But he's the one that penned those words about the broken vessel and the potter. You know, and what Israel was a broken vessel. But the point is this, that Jeremiah came to a point in his life where he said of man, he said, the heart of man, is deceitful above all things and it is desperately wicked. And then finally <coughs> in that verse he says who can know it? And <coughs> church listen there's one thing <coughs> that you and I need to know that will secure us that will fasten us down in this march that we're on toward heaven. And that is that we don't worry so much about what man has concocted or what man's teaching or what man's doing because man, if you don't watch him, he'll have you off doing his thing. 
Okay, Jamie, see if you can find for me in Acts chapter 5, and I believe, I can't tell you the number of this, but it's the very last verse of Scripture in, I believe it's the very last verse of Scripture in Acts chapter 5. It may be verse 42. That's a guess. <clears throat>
It's written in Romans somewhere. Paul wrote that book, and he said, you know what? <clears throat> it's hard to find someone who will die for a really, really good man. You know, and I thought, you know, how many people are there in this world that I would change places with to die for? You know, think of with her. Think of with my kids, my grandkids. How many of y'all think I would for you? <clears throat> but Paul said, you know what? died, substituted his, right. his death for everybody, every sinner, everybody that hated him. Listen, you think I'm going to die for somebody that's abused me and, and messed with me and hurt me? You know what Jesus did? Church, listen. Get a hold of the gravity of this. He, he died for the world so that we could live Oh. 